Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. And I'm Aaron Maté. And you know, I look, maybe it may look like I'm in a kind of bucolic hostage situation, but <laughs> don't worry, I'm not. I'm just visiting Maine, so I'm not in my usual setup. Yeah, I just don't want anyone to worry because I was doing my Katie Halper show live stream and people kept commenting in the in the comments. They were very worried, apparently. And well, Katie, if I could say, them. Yeah. If, I, if I can use my forensic investigation skills, my first clue that you're not in a hostage situation is how good your hair looks. Thank There's you, no Aaron. way a hostage's hair would look that good yeah. if they were in captivity. Yeah. Thank you. That's the tell. So that's, the, what reassured, the that's what reassured me. Yeah, yeah. You, you had a second of worry and then you saw the hair, the quaff, and you were, you were, uh, you were reassured. You know, I'm sitting a little bit more fourth wall breakage. I'm sitting on a very comfortable chair. Have you ever sat in a chair where you're kneeling, basically? Have you ever seen those chairs? I have sat in those chairs. I have sat in those yeah, chairs. Yeah, so there's I, nothing I behind once. my back. You got yeah, one yeah, yeah. I got one once because I had back issues and I was told that this, yeah. this chair was decent. But spoiler alert, it, this was this was not the answer. This was not the answer. It but wasn't the answer. I can it tell because you it is an it interesting. you're not doing it. Yeah, but it, it is an interesting uh, concept. And I yeah. encourage people to try it and see if it works for them. I like it because your weight is distributed among, like more evenly. It's not all in your lower back. So, you know, I have weight on my, I guess my shins, mm -hmm. my thighs. Well, they're, it's always on your thighs, but I guess it's what it involves is the your calves that are not usually involved as much. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. It definitely makes more sense than the traditional chair, right. which makes no sense at all. And yeah which does Which ruin totally backs did. around the world. Right. Well, should we get to our four food groups? Yeah, let's do it. So we got a great one. I mean, we always got great ones, but let's start with, as people know, the four basic food groups are the groups into which all news stories more or less can be divided. And they are Democrats suck, Republicans suck. Isn't that weird and isn't that terrible? So, so Aaron, you got the Democrats suck this week. What I got Democrats got? suck. And so this week we saw Barack Obama return to the White House to tout his celebrated, uh, his, his his signature achievement, which was the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, the White House was abuzz with accolades for Obama. This is the greatest thing ever. But just a few days before Obama arrived, his uh, chief aide, his chief strategist, David Axelrod. The walrus. The walrus. Also talked about health care and really sort of, I think, gave uh, the real story on what Obamacare really meant for the country and where our healthcare system is at, as he recounted through his own personal experience. So let's pull up the tweet. So this is David Axelrod on Twitter, just a few days before Obama came to the White House to tout the Affordable Care Act. And Axelrod says this, I've been taking a prescription for a chronic condition for years. This week, I learned my insurance no longer covers it. Now the cost is $639 a month. How many people can afford that? Your money or your life is a hell of a choice that people shouldn't have to face. And that is former Obama chief strategist, David Axelrod, who was there and helped uh, oversee the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And he's discovering that, I guess, the Affordable Care Act is insufficient. Yeah, and that, he, and that it basically preserved the same system that he is now critiquing, because while, yes, Millions of people did get to en enroll in healthcare programs as a result of that of the Affordable Care Act, and that's an achievement. It still left millions of people uninsured and basically propped up the power of private insurance companies and big pharma over right. our healthcare system. It was basically adopting Mitt Romney's plan. And so the the system that he's now finding himself critiquing is uh, one that he basically helped preserve with his Affordable Care Act. And the responses to David Axelrod really burned him for that. I mean, you can he got ratioed. And one of the best ones came from journalist Ken Klippenstein of The Intercept, who writes this, remember when you gave paid speeches to a health insurance trade group opposed to Medicare for all? And, uh, and that's the point here is that, you know, Obama and his circle they not only opposed Medicare for all, which would you know take away the power of big pharma and big insurance companies to jack up prices and keep people uninsured, 
but also even during the during the debate over the um, Affordable Care Act, you know, Obama initially promised that there would be a public option, that there would be right. the creation of, of a public health care system in which people could enroll in if they want to. But they dropped that very, very quickly. And then Axelrod uh, has continued to give speeches to health insurance companies opposing Medicare for all. Jesus Christ. Yeah, you kind of can't make it up. I mean, it speaks to how... It speaks to how pathetic our media is that he thought he could get away with that uh, without people, more people than Ken Clippenstein responding with this. Yeah. yeah. You know, like it's such an entitlement. He doesn't expect anyone to show up with any receipts. Yeah. And probably he didn't get asked about Medicare for all very much when he was in office because for the corporate media, that's just not even an issue under discussion. Right. When Obama, you mean when Obama was in office? Yeah. I mean, with, with Bernie's movement, and this is one of the lasting positive legacies of the, of the Bernie movement, is now it's on the agenda. And it's hard to ignore right. it now. But that was, that, was, that, that was what Obama did so skillfully on behalf of the insurance industry is basically framing it so that the Affordable Care Act is like the pinnacle of health care reform. That's the right. best we could possibly can get. get. Yeah, exactly. Right. Any other responses? Nina Turner had a great response, oh, too. Look at that. Congressional candidate, she says to David Axelrod, "You should care about these issues before they impact you personally." Yeah, which it's so so true. Like back when they were crafting healthcare policy, what David the the experience that David Axelrod is now talking about, did any of them even conceive of that? That some people, even with these reforms, are still not going to be able to afford healthcare. But now that now he's being reminded of it. And here's another one from uh, Ken Clevenstein a headline during the presidential uh, uh, primary 2019, Axelrod warns Medicare for all immigration proposals unpopular with voters. Right. So the guy is continuously lobbied against the only proposal on the table that could resolve all the problems he's critiquing, which is Medicare for all. You can't make this up. And can I, if I could just inject an, another tweet, I think this is kind of the cherry on top of the uh, shit Sunday that you are presenting to us, Aaron. So we got this tweet from Joe Biden. In America, healthcare should be a right, not a privilege. It only took him April 5th, 2022 to get that memo. Don't know where that was when he was running for president. Not sure he's going to do anything about it. But I'm sure, I'm sure he will do nothing about it because I'm sure I'm confident he will do everything in his power to do nothing about it. If you listen to the rhetoric now, they when they talk about healthcare being a right, not a privilege, in terms of how they want to see that right being actualized, they still frame it only in the, in the terms of giving people access to affordable right. healthcare. Yeah. If it's a right, if you actually believe that healthcare is a right, right. then you you're, you would be saying they should have healthcare, period. Right. Not, not access, access to healthcare, right. not a, access to affordable healthcare, just healthcare, period. But they won't say right. that. So I guess they're doing, I think they're doing maybe some damage control because they are anticipating some problems in the midterms. And the good news is they may not be doing anything for you and your loved ones, your health, when it comes to issues of life and death, but they got some good tweets. Great they feel tweets. your pain on Twitter. Yeah. They feel your pain on Twitter. Yeah. So that's half the battle. So, well, for Republican suck, we got a story about, um, you know, I don't, you, I don't, she gets a lot of attention, so I don't like to cover her, but I think this one is pretty, this is a, this is good enough to get some coverage from us. So, uh, of course, this is a, a Marjorie Taylor Greene story, just reading from Yahoo News. Um, Greene revives QAnon smear and attack on GOP senators backing Jackson's SCOTUS nomination. Rep. Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Republican of Georgia, on Monday launched an outlandish attack against three Republican senators who support Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's confirmation to the Supreme Court, accusing them of somehow being pro-pedophile, quote-unquote pro-pedophile. The line of attack echoes Greene's past support for the QAnon conspiracy theory that alleged former President Donald Trump was working to take down a powerful cabal of child traffickers typically portrayed as the Democratic elite. Believers in the debunked belief frequently have alleged that their political opponents support pedophiles. Earlier on Monday, Senators Lisa Murkowski and Mitt Romney said they would be joining fellow Republican Susan Collins of Maine in supporting President Biden's nominee to the Supreme Court in a final vote expected later this week. The, the accusation that Jackson had been light in her sentencing of child porn offenders originated with Senator Josh Hawley and was a running theme throughout her confirmation hearings, despite repeated analyses showing that Jackson's rulings were within the mainstream of her fellow judges. 
Even the conservative National Review magazine called the allegation against Jackson, quote, meritless to the point of demagoguery, end quote. That didn't stop uh, Green from calling these people who are saying they're going to vote for her uh, pro-pedophile. You can always rely on Green for speaking her mind. You never have to worry that she's going to hold back. Tough, it's a tough allegation. Mean, how do you even respond to being called pro-pedophile? Pro-pedophile? I know. PP, part of the pro-pedophile lobby. PPL, big, pe big pedo lobby. They're part of the big pedo lobby, yep. What emerged for me from these hearings is uh, that Judge Jackson has some pretty cool views. Like when she was defending Guantanamo Bay prisoners, some senators were mad at her that she said that basically Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush would be liable for war crimes. And that was in that their was eyes like a horrible thing. But I thought it was of awesome. Course. Yeah, I know. Can't believe she's going to be able to get on the court. That's great. Yeah, I guess that makes us pro-pedophile though. The oh yeah, we, we just, yeah, we just, we are part, we are doing the bidding of the big pedo lobby. Yeah. 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 We say that from a very anti-pedophile perspective, just yeah. so you know. I will so, say this though, Katie, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want you to have to endorse this view if you don't agree because it's, it's controversial, right. but I will say this, and we can cut this out if you, if, if it's too risky, I will say this, Marjorie Taylor Greene, as nutty as some of her views are, that's a more principal position than some members, than even members of the squad. And that's just right. a sad reflection of where right. the Democratic Party is at. Yeah. Maybe we can do it. You can be like, Katie, I'm going to say this and we can cut this out. And then we'll do a bleep censorship thing and the bars. And then if you want to see this, join our Substack at <laughs> usefulideas.substack.com. And you can see that's, what Aaron's talking about. That's a good scheme. We can do that. Every, I can come it, up right? with a crazy, I can come up with like a risque outlandish claim every week and we can do yeah. it for that. Yeah. yeah. So what do we got next? We got, isn't that weird, right? So for isn't that weird? We have a story of sheer terror from the skies. And it relates to a passenger who is engaged in a particular sort of behavior that has gotten him arrested. But it wasn't violence. It was, uh, I guess you can call it deviance. Uh, Ooh, well, and it is yeah. a Southwest passenger arrested for masturbating four times during a flight. Four times. Not once, not twice, not thrice, but four. Four times. And this I can understand once or twice, but four? <laughs> this is a domestic flight, too. So this is not even like an overseas trip. This is just yeah. a domestic flight. Great pun from the Daily Beast saying total jerk, which is exactly what this guy is and what he did. A man on a Southwest Airlines flight from Seattle to Phoenix. So how long is that, Katie, from Seattle? I was to thinking, Phoenix? yeah, how long is that? Anyone know? Uh, what do you guys think? Seattle to Phoenix? That's northwest to... I bet that's like an hour and a half at the most. Yeah, that Pretty is close. really... I mean, I'm dis I'm, I don't know if I'm disgusted or impressed or both. Oh, sorry. No, it's three hours. It's a three-hour flight. Okay, three Okay, hours. three hours. Still, yeah. all right. Still. Yeah, that's less impressive, but... A man on a Southwest Airlines flight from Seattle to Phoenix is facing federal charges for pulling down his pants and masturbating at least four times in front of a female passenger beginning shortly after takeoff. Antonio Sherrod McGarrity was arrested by officers from the Phoenix Police Department when Southwest Flight 3814 landed at Sky Harbor International Airport on Saturday, the complaint states. However, McGarrity told cops he didn't do anything wrong and in fact thought it was kind of kinky, the complaint says. The incident started early on in the three-hour flight when McGarrity commenced his indelicate behavior, the filing alleges. McGarrity was seated in seat 11F and the female witness was seated in seat 11E. Oh, so they're right next to each other. The worst. Oh my God. Shortly after taking off and while the aircraft was in the air, McGarrity exposed his penis by pulling down his pants and shorts and began masturbating. When the female seated next to him noticed the lewd behavior, she began taking pictures of McGarrity. When he fell asleep after masturbating for roughly an hour, the female passenger, I'm sorry to laugh, the female passenger told the crew member about what she had witnessed and was allowed to move to another seat. Damn right. I mean, she should be upgraded to- First class for life. For life, for having to endure that. Yeah. The complaint states that when Southwest Airlines flight landed, Phoenix police officers interviewed the woman who reiterated she had seen McGarrity masturbating on four separate occasions using both his left and right hands. Ambidextrous. <laughs> or McGarrity just also was also interviewed by FBI agents who allegedly admitted to his in-flight behavior. 
McGarity advised that he asked the female witness if she minded if he masturbates. According to McGarity, the female witness put her hands in the air and said it doesn't really matter. McGarity thought the response was kind of kinky and believed the female was comfortable with him masturbating. The complaint adds, in a statement to the, to the Daily Beast, a Southwest spokesperson said McGarity had been slapped with a lifetime ban. Well deserved. He probably thinks that's kinky. He probably... <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, I mean, I, you know, now obviously this, this situation is not something to laugh at because, the, you know, this is serious and there are people been accused of similar things who have, you know, really uh, traumatized people who've been yes. the subject of a set like that. So right. it's just, the, and obviously this guy has serious issues and the, right. the, that, that, that needs to be addressed. And I'm right. sure he will face charges on top of being banned for life from southwest right. yeah i mean i'm curious if that's true if i'm i don't want to victim blame because she is a victim um because she was ex this guy exposed himself to her and actually did worse than just exposing you know he actually masturbated in front of her four times i am curious about the sequencing of events because she i guess waited now maybe she was scared but yeah. she did take out her camera i guess and take photos but that just could be documenting the crime, you know. Yeah, no, it's documenting the crime. Yeah. If if she did say, if she did throw up her hands and say it doesn't really matter, maybe because she was scared, she felt like she was being coerced. But yeah, the or, or the that, guy's lying. Or the guy's lying. Or the guy's lying, right. Of course, yeah. that's very possible, right? We should definitely enter. Yeah, that's definitely an option. But yeah, I would have probably asked for the upgrade, uh, the seat change a little earlier, although I admire her her law and order skills like i i do admire that she documented it i don't know if i would have been able to do that maybe yeah. like a second of documentation and then request the change seat i'll say this i was in a sauna once at the ymca in montreal and a guy started jerking off and for a second i froze it's a little it's a little jarring you know you kind of don't right. know what to do and i just got up and left was it just that. you but and the guy it was just me and the guy yeah. You tell anyone? Have I, I? I have told people. I mean, at the I didn't like go well, to like. Oh, yeah. I didn't go to the staff. And, no, 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 no. Because I felt I, I didn't want to. You know, I didn't want to be a snitch. <laughs> snitch it, stitches are for snitches. The, the the grossest line of this piece you missed. You got to read the last sentence of this paragraph. Okay, so this is the this is the witness, Damn. and she told this is according to the police statement. She suspected that McGarity ejaculated because he licked a white substance from his fingers. That's Gross. so disgusting. Here's hoping Gross. he had just eaten some powdered donuts and that's what it was. <laughs> a girl can dream. Wow. Yeah. 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 Or I guess I guess to be, you know, not not quite white powdered. I was thinking the white powdered donuts that came to my head, but really it should have been Boston cream. Oh, okay. All I'm right. sorry. All right. All right. Well, I think we've I think we've covered that story sufficiently. I think we've exhausted that story. Yeah, yeah that's one of yeah. those weird slash terrible, but those things are often they often walk a a fine line. So <laughs> yes, for my do. for my isn't that terrible? Albert Pujols is divorcing his wife of 22 years. On Monday, Pujols announced that he was filing for divorce. The announcement came days after the news that his wife Deirdre had undergone successful surgery to remove a brain tumor. Tuesday, TMZ reported that Pujols cited irreconcilable differences in the filing and that the couple has been split up since February. Albert and Deirdre Pujols have uh, share five children and the MLB slugger reportedly requested joint custody of the three who are minors. I've been asked a lot of questions over the past few days regarding what's going on at home. And sadly, after 22 years of marriage, I have made the decision to file for divorce from my wife, Deirdre, Pujols said in a statement released by his agent. I realize this is not the most opportune time. So that's nice, right? He's realizing it's not the most opportune time, right? Because his wife just had brain surgery. No, that's not what he means by that. I realize this is not the most opportune time with opening day approaching and other family that. events that have recently taken place. These situations are never easy and isn't something that just happened overnight. As a devout Christian, this is an outcome that I never want to see happen. For many long days and nights, I prayed asking the Lord for his guidance. So apparently the Lord's guidance was divorce your wife shortly after she gets brain surgery. I mean, it could have been worse. It could have been, I guess, unsuccessful brain surgery, which would have made him that much more of a terrible person. 
But I think there should be, I think, I kind of think you got to stick around a little bit more. Like, I understand you don't have to stay with someone forever just because they had brain surgery. But what do you think the statute of limitations or the reverse, the, the minimum time? Yeah, I mean, and at be? minimum, don't cite opening day as... Oh, my God, what a prick. As, like, why this is not a good time. Right. Because right. she had surgery. That's the right. only issue here. And he's yeah. trying to make... Yeah, that is... I mean, if it's, if, if it's insensitive it to get to split up after such an important event, it's all the more insensitive to try to frame it as being inopportune because opening day is coming soon. Yeah. That's yeah, that's weird. That's awful. That's awful. So isn't that terrible? And I say to her, good riddance. I hope you get a great settlement. Yes. Absolutely. Drag him. Absolutely. Drag him. Make him absolutely. pay through the nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's that isn't that terrible? And I hope he does terribly in baseball. I hope he's I hope he gets a lot of foul hits the bat and whatever it's a foul ball. However, what is the verb is that of that is a season of fouls. Yes, a season of fouls. Or I hope he strikes out. Yeah. All right. So that's our those are the four basic food groups. We are so excited to talk to David Sirota. He is the founder and editor in chief of Lever News, which is formerly known as the Daily Poster. It's great, great website. Everyone should check it out. He's an Oscar nominee for the film Don't Look Up. He's also the narrator of a great Audible uh, original called Meltdown. He's a columnist at The Guardian and Jacobin. And he is the husband of Representative Emily Sirota, who is a Colorado State representative of the District 9. And he, of course, was a speechwriter and advisor for Bernie Sanders. Follow him on Twitter at David Sirota. Welcome, David Sirota. We are so excited to have you back on Useful Idiots. This is a historic appearance, though, because this is your first time on as an Oscar nominee, right? <laughs> yes. Well, yes. All right. I didn't yes. miss anything from before this. And, of course, that was for your amazing film don't look up which was on netflix and uh the second most watched netflix film ever yes it was the uh, second uh most watched movie on the world's largest streaming platform so um i never thought i'd participate in making a movie i, I certainly never thought i'd participate in making a movie that got that big an audience and i Absolutely never thought I would be um, nominated for an Oscar. Um, we didn't and win. And awarded a Writers Guild. And we won the Writers Guild uh, Award for Best Screenplay, yes. I saw a picture of Kenneth Branagh recently and was like, Branagh! We, we, right. we lost to Kenneth Branagh on Best Screenplay. But, you know, a friend of mine said, listen, if you lose to one of the greatest actors in the modern history of the, of the world, like, you can't feel that bad. So, right. I agree with that. Yeah, you can't feel that deprived. Right, exactly. Did you see Belfast? Uh, I did. Uh, yeah. I did, and it's it's you know it's a it's a very different movie from from ours. That was that was actually the the thing that I was I sort of never I you know I don't pay attention that much to the Oscars and the like. But one thing that, that you know when you get nominated for an Oscar, you then start paying like a lot of attention to it, and it's just kind of weird that like. And this is not a commentary on any of the other movies. It's just kind of like our movie was so different from most of the other movies that it was it's almost it's almost kind of bizarre to have it like in a in the same kind of category. contest yeah. as every yeah, it's like a different genre, different category. It's just it's just kind of a weird, a weird process like that. Yeah. They need to the best allegory about uh impending <laughs> doom category. Right, exactly. Picture. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to first talk about politics and um, uh, in a direct way, your film is very political. So we're going to be talking about politics through that. But let's just let's just get the Oscar talk out of the way, because, you know, people people are are really want to hear it. I got to ask, where were you? I know you weren't in the room at the time of the great slap. <laughs> you could have had you been there, you would have had a, a great view view of this am i correct absolutely uh i was i was sitting probably 10 or 15 feet from where will smith was sitting uh i was not in the room uh i was out uh having a drink uh at the bar with adam mckay maggie gyllenhaal and peter sarsgaard adam me and maggie had just learned that we were not getting the oscar so we were out sort of commiserating about it and 
somebody, I forget who it was, came by and said, uh, Will Smith slapped uh, Chris Rock on stage. And to be quite frank, it didn't make any sense to me. Like that, like that, like when some, so it didn't, like, it was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, well, that doesn't, what is, I don't even know what that means. Right. And, and then when, by the time we got back into the theater, Will Smith was then winning his best actor award. And he gave this speech that to me, it was like, I was like, I'm not even sure what he's talking about. Like he's, he's, it's just like an incoherent sort of some kind of damage control on something, but I don't really know what he's actually even exactly talking about. So it was a, a very bizarre, um, disorienting experience uh, for me. And I, and everybody of course asked me what, what, what happened in the room when, it, when, when, when the slap happened and I'm like, mm, I was out having a drink. <laughs> right. Sadly, you could have, you could have waited could have on been there. the most <laughs> important discussion gripping yes. the nation. Yeah. How did you get involved in this project in the first place? Uh, because I know you're you're you were credited as the story, right? So you didn't you're not a screenwriter on it. Right, you're the right. story creator. So what what was the process like that you even got it to Adam McKay? So Adam and I have been friends for a long time, uh, many years, really. I think it's fifteen or almost twenty years. Uh, and he and I talk about a lot of things all the time. He's very um, into politics, so am I, obviously. And uh, after uh, we actually spent the uh, 2016 election night uh, together with uh, the cast of Succession, because I happened to be in New York, he was there, uh, and they were doing their first table read on the uh, on the show, and it was a it was a night where we were both looking at each other like we we sort of knew that was going to happen. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, we I I, I don't want to. I don't want to say I, I predicted it, but it was like it was sort of like confirming all of the concerns that we had had about what was happening on the campaign uh, and what was happening sort of longer term uh, to the Democratic Party. By the way, not to say that I you know, thought that Hillary Clinton was such a fantastic uh, candidate. I obviously, if anybody knows my work, I did not think she was a particularly fantastic uh, candidate, to say the least. Uh, but after that, uh, right after that, his movie Vice came out which I thought was an absolutely terrific movie. And it was a very divisive movie, more divisive than The Big Short. Uh, and, and in my view, it was divisive because it had the audacity to actually um, talk about things that you're not really allowed to talk about very much in our typical media environment. You know, stuff like uh, out of control wars, you know, the neoconservative movement, uh, the movement to consolidate power in the presidency, all that stuff is the center, central focus of that movie, and it was very divisive, and it's also an actually a, a, a hilarious movie. So I said to him, I had written the climate story uh, uh, around that time, and, and I said to him, I was like, you know, you really have to use your superpowers of mixing comedy and politics to say something about the climate crisis. And he said, yeah, you know, I know, but I just, I haven't been able to figure out how to do this without it being a kind of dystopian, post-apocalyptic, Mad Max uh, uh, kind of movie. And I don't want to do that. Mm. So we were talking and I, I, I had done, was doing this series of climate stories. And I said to him, I was like, you know, at one point I said, it's such a bummer. I, I don't know why these stories, they don't gain traction. They don't really, they don't feel like they land. And I said, it's kind of feels like an asteroid is headed towards earth and nobody cares. And he said, you know, maybe there's an idea there for a movie. And so we started spitballing scenes and going back and forth over a course of a number of weeks about, Oh, you know, if an asteroid is headed towards earth, the, uh, the bill to fund uh, uh, asteroid deflection would be uh, blocked because there would be a government shutdown or because we got distracted on a war over here or because we just couldn't focus. And if the media tried to process it, it would be like a one day story and then it would go away. And he said, I, I, OK, I, I've got enough like of, of these ideas. I'm going to go and try to draft a script. He came back with a script. We spitballed a bunch of other ideas. We po- you know, I gave him some notes and he said, we're going to go try to make this movie. And I kind of eye rolled it a little bit because in Hollywood, you hear a lot of things are maybe going to happen, could happen, but they don't necessarily happen and it was hard for me to believe that we would be able to make a movie with the messages that our movie has it was hard hard for me to believe anybody would touch it 
And then he said, you know, Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio are interested in this. And I was like, well, that's got to help, but like, I'll believe it when I see it. And then like a week later, he's like, hey, we're sending the paperwork over. This is actually happening. And and so here we are. And it's, I've, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I, I really think it's not just a credit to Adam for being just an unbelievably amazing director and writer, but it's also a credit to that huge cast, which it's not that they're martyrs, but that Look, a lot of folks in Hollywood, there's, and I shouldn't pick on any one person. It's sort of the culture is to try to avoid controversy. It's like a risk aversion, like there is in a lot of industries. And so those actors being willing to be, to participate in this, knowing that the movie would be almost inherently divisive and controversial, I really appreciate that they were willing to put their fame and notoriety into a project like this because they didn't have to, right? I mean, you look at that cast, I mean, that cast can pick whatever movie they wanna work on. So the fact that they wanted to do this and were willing to do this again, they got remunerated well, they're not martyrs or anything like that, but they have a, a choice of whatever they wanna do. And so being willing to actually make a movie that was going to be greeted with uh, the kind of, uh, uh, love and hate that the movie uh, uh, was was inherently going to elicit. You know, I I just I really appreciate that. Hmm. Can you read us the speech that you were going to deliver? Had you one? You want me to read you the exact speech? Yeah, it was it was short, right? It was very short, and and I'll I'll tell you this: when the the Oscar luncheon, there's this luncheon that they do before the Oscars, where they tell you. They give you advice on uh, not just advice. They sort of urge you to take what they're gonna, what they're saying seriously, and what they're saying. They they tell you essentially run up to the stage, don't hug or kiss anybody. Get up there as fast as you can because you'll be played off the stage as quickly as right. possible. I, I at at our website, the lever. I published this little piece of paper I had. I wrote I wrote down the night before what I was gonna say. Uh, and some people have been like, well, why didn't you say this? Why weren't you going to say this? And this is because basically I was told you have like, you can say like two or three lines and then get off the stage. But, but right. here is what I was going to say. I was going to basically say thanks to my parents, my brothers, Jeff and Steven, my wife, Emily, our kids, Isaac and Zoe, and thanks to Netflix and Adam McKay and to the climate journalists at the lever and to every journalist, scientist, and activist who's been sounding the climate alarm. And then I was going to say, Everyone in this room, the room being the Oscars, everyone in this room has an enormous amount of power. So I have one request. Please actually use that power to demand climate action now. Our survival and our kids' future depends on it. That's what I was going to say. And the reason I wanted to use the opportunity to say that was because that industry, the culture industry, has an enormous amount of power over how we think about things, uh, over not just how we think about things, but what we think are the things we should focus on. I mean, that is truly what Hollywood and the entertainment industry and, and as a, a, you know, the advertising industry, they don't just sell products, they create demand for specific kinds of products and content. And so I think that our movie, the response to our movie showed there's a huge pent up demand for cultural products and content that struggles with the scary major issues of the day, rather than simply distracting us. Uh, and that the folks in that room have an enormous amount of power to actually focus our attention. And additionally, the movie's giant audience proves that you don't have to choose between focusing on important things and not having a big audience or focusing on stupid, silly things and getting a big audience. That There's actually a way that you can do both at the same time, as our movie, I think, proved. And what are the asks that the movie makes or that you want other movies like this to be making in terms of what can be done by politicians, by individuals? What, what is the, the thing that everyone can do? Well, look, I don't think the, the, our movie did not try to 
make specific prescriptions. Oh, we have to do this policy or that policy. I think the first thing we that, that our movie tried to do was to say uh, is that when scientists say a crisis is urgent and the facts have been interrogated about that crisis and the facts are unquestionable, are verified unquestionable. And I think hopefully we can all agree that the climate crisis is a crisis. It's a big problem. It is real. And we should do something about it. That when that alarm is sounded and we need to be able to stipulate those facts uh, after verifying them and then be able to have a constructive discussion uh, about what to do. And that we're still at the stage in the climate crisis, I would argue, in which we haven't necessarily stipulated that it's urgent. In some cases, we haven't necessarily stipulated that it's even really real, right? So our movie, I think, was part of trying to grab everybody by the lapels and be like, this is what happens when we don't listen. And I think moving forward, there can be all sorts of content about what the right policy is or or what needs to be done and who's not listening. I mean, here's the thing. If you actually take a look at so much of cultural content today, you know what's really interesting? Because I hadn't really thought of this until working on this movie. Do you see the climate crisis even in the background? Like, do you, like, like even just sort of at, at, maybe there's a human drama happening in the foreground and then in the background there there's torrential rains or there's a flood like you barely even see the climate crisis in that context right i remember in in um the film a uh, parasite the climate crisis is oh, actually yeah. there kind of at least and it's an unbelievably amazing movie about right. you know sort of power and class and and, and extra extra credit to having the climate crisis Man. is right there. The rain, the floods, et cetera. Like in most movies and TV shows in America, it's not, the climate crisis is, is, has, is erased. It's not even there. And the problem with that is, look, there's a segment of the population that essentially denies that either the climate change, climate change is happening or that it's a problem, okay? Then there's a segment of the population that knows climate change is a problem, is convinced that it's urgent, uh, and has already been is already there. The real set of the population that we need to reach imminently are the are the the large. I don't want to call it the middle, but this large swath of people, according to polls, who accept climate science, uh, who know it's a problem, but don't necessarily uh, know how urgent it is and don't are, are sort of ambivalent about how urgently we need to act on it. And I think part of, of that is, is about the fact that the climate crisis isn't really part of the cultural ecosystem in our media, in all the information that we consume. Like there's the climate story every now and again that's, that's called a climate story right? It's over here. Maybe there's one big expose and then the climate crisis sort of goes away, right? It's not part of the, of the baked in daily way that we talk about politics and the news. Uh, and, and it's not part of, as I just said, it's not even really part of the background of sort of all of our cultural products that we, that we consume on a daily basis. So mobilizing that part of the population is in part a challenge to, to put the climate crisis that is actually happening, to put that into the story uh, of the world around us, the stories that we're telling ourselves. There's a scene that I wanna ask you about. And so this is a bit of a spoiler alert for anybody who's not seen the movie. <laughs> Maybe fast forward this question and answer, and I'll try to withhold as many details as I can. But basically it's a scene in which your protagonists are realized, have realized that their efforts have failed, that catastrophe is coming. And yet they're greeting the moment with complete peace and serenity. They're having dinner basically together and they're commiserating. And I just thought that was, there's something really beautiful about that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what informed that scene choice to have your protagonists react that way to something that they tried with all their might to avoid, but they ultimately couldn't. 
Aaron, thanks for asking that question. It's a great question. Um, I, I, I will answer it by first saying, and this is a spoiler alert, but after the right when the movie was finished shooting, um, Adam called me, uh, and we were, we were they were going to submit the sort of rough cut to Netflix, and he said, and he he basically expressed a little bit of trepidation, like. Uh, is Netflix going to be okay with us uh, ending the movie the way we end the movie? And and I guess I'll, let's just say it doesn't end very happily uh, uh, for humanity. Uh, and, and I was very much like, man, that's the only way this movie can end. Like it, it has to end that way. Uh, and, and he, he, you know, he wrote the script. So and I also told him, like, listen, it's the ending that you submitted to the script that Netflix bought. So you, they can't pretend to be surprised. Um, and what ended up happening was, is that, you know, he, he stuck with it. We, we, Netflix loved it. And in the audience tests of the movie, the ending is the thing that, that generated the best response uh, of most of, of, the, of the movie. So I think... Listen, I, I think that the movie is the story of these two scientists is the story of two pieces of a rational brain. There's Kate DiBiaschi, the younger uh, scientist played by Jennifer Lawrence, who is freaked out about the discovery of the asteroid, the comet headed towards Earth, uh, and who has trouble believing that the government and society is going to take it seriously and do anything. Uh, and she's the first one who sort of throws up her hands and gives up. Uh, after trying, she makes an effort. Then there's the um, Randall Mindy character, the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio character, who tries to play within the system, knows that, that it's a scary situation, but holds out hope that he can get this dysfunctional society to respond constructively. Uh, and then he sort of gets kind of co-opted and a little bit corrupted. And then he's disgusted with himself. And finally, by the end, the, you know, he he finds himself in the same place as Kate DiBiaschi. I think the the end is it's kind of where we'd all like to hope that if that situation, if a situation like that happened, that we would all end up, which is like we really and she says at the at the dinner table, she says we, we tried. Uh, and it's a very, you know, it's the thing is that it's a very unsatisfying comment because it's both, it's both sad and it's, um, it's demoralized, obviously, but it's also real. Now, I want to, I want to say one other thing about that, which is that my concern when the movie came out was that I didn't want people to see the end at the dinner table as prophecy or destiny. I want people to see it and people can see it any way they want, but I want people to see it as cautionary. There's a line in, in Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, rant and he says something to the effect of, we could have stopped it. And that's where I think we are in the, in the story of climate change, that, that he's lamenting that we actually, in the movie, they actually had the wherewithal, the technological wherewithal. They knew how to stop it. They could have done it. And, and he's confused, perplexed, and angry that, that it could have been stopped. And really, it wasn't a matter of, of, of ability technology that the reason it wasn't stopped was because of the dysfunction. And that, to me, is somewhat hopeful in the sense that I still believe that, that the climate crisis and mitigating the effects of it are still well within our control. We don't have that like exact forecast. Yeah. So how, how do we make, I feel like part of the job is that we have to kind of like lay it out to the extent that we know, but we also, things change, right? You don't know exactly how it's going to go. And then you have skeptics or anti-science people who point to the fact that it didn't exactly happen the way it was predicted to kind of undermine science in general. So it's somewhat tricky because you do want to kind of scare people into waking up, but there are a lot of unknowns. So what's your advice? You're totally right. I mean, you're, you're, you look, you're absolutely right. And this is why the allegory, I think was, it, it, there's been this criticism, oh, the allegory is not perfect. And my response is, you're correct. That's it's it's an allegory. Right. You know, we we 
sped uh, it, we sped up the timeline of a crisis to um, dramatize what is happening over a longer period of time. The trick with climate change is, is that is that people perceive it to still be, especially older people, I think, perceive it to be outside the scope of their own lifetime. I have this theory, by the way, that if we suddenly, uh, uh, there was this great uh, book by um, Drew uh, McGarry uh, about, uh, what was it called? It was called The uh, the, the Post-Mortal, where, where it's a great science fiction book, where they, they found a way to give people a shot that would freeze them in time and they could live essentially forever or at least to like a thousand years old, right? And I have a theory that if everybody, if the average age of, the, of a human being would be a thousand year life, lifespan, that everyone would suddenly care a lot more about climate change because mm. you'd know you'd be living through it, like through the really bad part. So it is a huge, huge problem that climate change's perceived timeline, and I want to underscore perceived, we'll get to that in a second, but that its perceived timeline is perceived to be outside of the scope of a human, uh, of an older human being's lifetime. Uh, now, I say perceived because, of course, uh, we know that the uh, some of the worst effects of it are happening uh, in the very near future. We we know that, um, and so how do we get our society to respond in a in a short term emergency kind of way? to something that is still perceived to be long-term. I think part of it is that, that uh, frankly, public education, like to educate the public about the fact that this is a short-term here and now crisis. That's a, go back to what I said about, you know, the large swath of the population who accepts climate science, but doesn't necessarily see it as an urgent problem. Like that is a critical, part of this. So, and, and, and so why is it a critical part? It's a critical part because then when, they, when people see their public officials not acting with urgency, then it becomes electorally actionable as opposed to just one or another issue. In other words, if we see and feel that a crisis is in the here and now, and then we see and hear about our elected officials not treating it with urgency, at least in theory, that makes it a central part of how we decide who our representatives are, who we decide has political power in this country. And I think, I think frankly, the jury is still out on whether Climate change is an electorally is an electorally central and actionable issue. I mean, we just reported uh, at the Lever uh, this week on a just as one example a, a congressional race in Oregon, where the Democratic establishment and part of the progressive movement have lined up behind a candidate who's been pushing a massive fossil fuel infrastructure plan in the blue state of Oregon, and. In, in, a, in an alternate reality where we understand how urgent the crisis is, that would be a central dividing point litmus test issue in a, a run-of-the-mill congressional race. But it, it, it isn't necessarily yet. And so that goes back to the problem of not necessarily seeing this as urgent, even though it is. And I, I want to be clear, I don't mean to pick only on that candidate in Oregon, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a microcosm of how the, to use the metaphor, the comet is headed towards earth. People are running for office uh, who have been on one side or the other of whether to stop the climate, excuse me, the comet. And it, it's not necessarily top of mind for voters who are choosing who to put in power. And, and that's the problem. Yeah. The card that often gets played in defense of fossil fuel intensive projects is jobs, that these projects create jobs. Do you think we on the progressive side have done a good enough job in coming up with alternatives to counter that argument, which is constantly deployed, that if you support this, you're going to take away working class people's jobs? Right. Listen, I'm, you know, I'm talking to you from Colorado, and that argument defines the way fossil fuels are discussed in this state. And we are an oil and gas state, and it is maddening. It is maddening for a number of reasons. 
first and foremost, the fossil fuel industry simply does not create that many jobs. And by that, I mean, yes, there are people who work in and around the fossil fuel industry, but as a percentage of the economy, it is a relatively minuscule part of the economy, even in a fossil fuel state like Colorado. And that is in part because of technological advancements and the like. Point being that it's almost part of the mythology, but not part of the reality. But the mythology is perpetuated by political campaign ads. It's perpetuated by a media that simply sort of vomits up uh, the, the kind of jobs argument uh, that you mentioned. It, it's, it's almost never debunked. Uh, and Democrats, I think, they sort of, they never, they never, uh, they rarely ever frontally challenge the idea that uh, uh, of this idea of some huge link between fossil fuel uh, extraction and jobs. They, they never just say, actually, it, it, it's, it's a lot of nonsense uh, that, that the energy transition, and by the way, the fossil fuel cleanup, that's another, there's not just uh, jobs in, the, uh, in, in clean energy industries, but there's lots of jobs to be created in simply cleaning up fossil fuel industries mess. You know, for instance, uh, capping wells. That may sound like an esoteric issue, but the, when the fossil fuel companies drill a well, uh, oftentimes they just leave. Uh, and that, of course, uh, leaks methane. There's a huge amount of jobs to be created in just cleaning that up. But, but the point is, is that that's not nearly as much of the conversation around the economic uh, uh, questions about this. I mean, and then, and, and the thing that obviously I think, you know, it's, it's just mind boggling is, I mean, it goes back, I mean, there's two, there's two lines that this, that, that, that your question brings up to me is one uh, is my favorite line in the whole movie is when Jennifer Lawrence's character comes home uh, and she comes to her parents' house uh, and her, 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 she comes in her dad and, you know, she's been now famous for having blown the whistle on the comet and her dad says, no politics in this house. If you come in back into our house, you can't talk politics. She's like, how's a comet politics? And then her mom says, uh, uh, your father and I are for the jobs that the comet will bring, right? And that's sort of to, to, to kind of illustrate how pervasive uh, this argument is, even though it's ridiculous. And the other line it brings up is, you know, they're talking about how we can, you know, we can have the comet, the comet's going to create wealth. And you hear that about the fossil fuel industry. And at one point, Leonardo DiCaprio says to the president, what do all these trillions of dollars mean if we're all going to die? Right. I mean, ultimately, I'm, I'm not insensitive to people who are working in the fossil fuel industry, who, uh, who, who have skills that can be transitioned to the clean energy economy. Those people are not uh, the villains here. Uh, those folks uh, deserve to be supported in a transition. Absolutely. Uh, but, but the point is, is that there's also this question of, of why are we preserving an industry and preserving jobs uh, if in 10, 15, 20 years, the livable ecosystem that supports all human life is going to be uh, significantly deteriorated or gone. I mean, I'm, again, coming to you from Colorado, there are vast swaths of this state that if you look at the map of what's going to happen because of climate change in our lifetime, vast swaths of our state that may not be livable. So what is what, what are we talking about jobs if we're not first talking about like making sure you can like actually uh, live in a state, live in vast parts of the United States? But that's, again, that's like rarely ever discussed. And I think a lot of it, look, if we're being honest, a lot of it has to do with not only the campaign, look, the fossil fuel industry made that argument when they uh, proposed uh, uh, fracking restrictions in this state, uh, uh, but it's also that, that the media industry at some level knows where it gets its money, right? The fossil, the idea that the fossil fuel industry spends a ton of money on advertising and gets nothing in return for it uh, from sort of the media ecosystem is a lot of nonsense, 
right? I mean, that is part of this, is, is the unwillingness to, to, to have an honest conversation about what we really face. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. That was great, huh? That was really cool. He's a really insightful and funny guy and I think has a good perspective on this moment of Hollywood fame that he just experienced. And it was, yeah. it was cool to hear about it. Yeah, very cool. And make sure you become uh, Substack subscribers because you're definitely going to want to hear us talk to David Sirota about the uh, celebrities he met. We go over some interesting photographs of him that he posted on Twitter um, with various celebrities. So that's good. It's good fun. Good trouble. Yeah. Good trouble. Uh, it would be nice if we could save the world. Well, one Hollywood blockbuster at a time. One Hollywood blockbuster at a time, yeah. Yeah. Katie, where can people go if they want to support the show? They can go to usefulidiots.substack.com. They can also subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash usefulidiots. Uh, make sure you rate and review us as a podcast. That would be great. We'll Tune in Monday, Monday morning. morning. Yeah, Monday morning on YouTube. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Hello, thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. 